Hi, my name is Anthony Parkinson from Ansel Lighting. I lead the technical team who provide customer support for the business as well as support for the internal and external sales functions. Today is going to be a seminar on fire testing and fire rated downlights within the electrical industry, including the challenges faced by everyone involved. So what is fire testing? Fire testing isn't new. The industry has been conducting this for quite a few years. Fire testing is used to replicate a set of conditions as similar as possible as to what is used in the construction industry. Now this is a broad statement as there are hundreds of construction companies with thousands and tens of thousands of joiners all capable of building and installing, constructing differently from one another. And this is a variable we are, that we are unable to control. In more recent years, there's been an increase in engineered joists. There are quite a few reasons for this. Uh, as always, cost is one, uh, the length of joists required being another. Load bearing capacity uh, of these longer lengths um, dictating often. Engineered joists are used in the vast majority of new build properties also. I mentioned other serv services as the introduction of these has increased the engineered joist usage and in turn it has increased the airflow in the void between joists. Therefore, in the event of a fire, it will spread far quicker, making the downlights an integral and very important part of the ceiling's fire barrier. On the right, you'll see a blueprint for a test area. This is something I will expand on further into the cinema, but it is also incredibly relevant when talking about replicating a set of conditions. Why is it required? Firstly, why I'm talking to you about this today is because of a change instigated by the NHBC in August of last year and implemented in the January of this year. This change was a long time coming with an outdated 30 minute specification not covering three storey new single dwelling homes. 30 minutes in actual facts covers dwellings up to five metres and now has the addition of the introduction of three storey dwellings to a 30 minute specification. The change in August was to cover this. By testing itself, it's proved the introduction of a light fixture, in most cases a downlight, will not affect the integrity of the fire barrier. The two ways of doing this is either by using an intumescent material or a borosilicate glass. Just as equally important to this, however, is a downlight can and the springs on the can. If these were to fail and not hold the can in, in its place, this in turn preventing the intumescent or borosilicate glass to perform its job in preventing the fire traveling through the void and to the floor above. Limitations, a very interesting topic. Within the industry and across testing, various quantities are being used. Now the limits of or minimum number isn't set. What I will say is the idea of fighting testing is to replicate a real life scenario. So we ourselves, we would use nine downlights in a three meter by four meter full scale test, which will be very typical of what is used in the same area within a home or a dwelling. But in some cases, other tests have included up to 16 downlights in one test area and some as little as four. So again, another variable when considering testing as a full scale test. Challenges facing the industry. In my opinion, the main reason why I'm just, 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 in my opinion, challenges facing the industry. In my opinion, the main reason why I am discussing this today, we as a collective internally, that's every manufacturer, have had so many discussions on construction whether this be plasterboards, joists, downlights, 
overall, there is just a huge amount of uncertainty on what a construction specification would look like. There's little guidance to be found. The general consensus is that we would like to see what the worst case specification would look like in every single building type. The LIA uh, recently introduced the task force. As you can see, uh, the LIA instigated what is fairly unprecedented with the introduction of a task force, which the focus of it is to instruct the LIA, is for us as a manufacturer to instruct the LIA to have discussions with both the NHBC and the STA, which is the Structural Timber Association, so that they can represent their members, being us, the manufacturers, as a whole, and at that point gain further clarification of exactly what is required in every single ceiling specification. Compliance also isn't just limited to five eighty down lights. The LIA have been pushing with audits for, of, for levels of compliance across all luminaires for years now. So compliance is a real focus within the industry. We are responsible as our other manufacturers to comply. This brings me nicely on to due diligence. But we cannot simply click our fingers and everyone will use a compliant downlight. What does happen though is a cost factor will enter the discussion, whether this be at the contractor or purchasing stage. This is a very real issue. When dealing with such a subject where potentially fires could spread far quicker and cause injury or worse. Again, I'll revert back to why I'm here discussing the subject today. The NHBC are enforcing, to a certain extent, a no sign-off policy unless a valid test report is produced. This has and will continue to wean out any installed non-compliant product, forcing the contractor to use and replace in effect uh, non-compliant downlights with compliant downlights often more often than not that is at the cost of the contractor uncertainty on assessments this in my opinion is where we come across the majority of the speculation and uncertainty now this wasn't an issue with solid timber it only became an issue when we started down the path of engineered joists uh, AILOT stands for assessments in lieu of test. So I'm going to get a little bit wordy now. The guidance in Appendix B and paragraph one to five of Appendix A and of, of approved documents B, volume one and two, has been amended to ensure that assessments in lieu of tests are only used where necessary and are carried out in, a, in an appropriate way. The guidance clarifies that an assessment in lieu of test should not be regarded to avoid undertaking a test where one is necessary and should only be carried out where sufficient relevant test evidence is available. Tests and assessments should be carried out by organisations with the necessary expertise. For example, organisations listed as notified bodies in accordance with the European Construction Products Regulation or laboratories accredited by UCAS for the relevant test standard. So that pretty much means that assessments in lieu of test is something we can do, but it's got to be conducted by a, a third party body. So for instance, a test house, which would use for a full scale test, they can look up one test report, which shows the downlight on one test report, which shows a, a ceiling construction and a pass, and then put them together and. And there are quite a few variables to take into account, which I will go into, but that's how the assessment in lieu of test is handled. Assessments, though, is something that we at Tansel have utilised and will continue to do so. In conjunction, in conjunction with test houses and other joist manufacturers, they will then be able to compare the construction and build that we have achieved our positive results in and ensure that it is close enough to their own specification, thus concluding the cross-assessment. As a manufacturer, we are advised and would advise from ourselves to others to make sure that an overrun of the fire test is also conducted between, well, up to 20% more, which is 36 minutes on a 30 minute test, 72 minutes on a 60 minute test, and 108 minutes on a 90 minute test. 
This then helps the assessment to be a less complicated process by allowing for these variables to be taken into consideration when comparing joist types. We are, as of today, still waiting on guidance from the NHBC with regards to assessments. Um, and with iJoist, we believe that once they are set out the guidelines for what is a worst case scenario in duration and ceiling types, we will have covered what we needed to and assessments will be much easier to achieve. Before moving on to the next slide, we've also asked for clarification with regards to other services and by other services, I do mean anything that breaks the ceiling barrier. For instance, a home audio system, which is largely made of plastic, uh, and generally quite a large surface area taken up compared to downlights. Um, we're, we're asking for what guidance they've been given uh, on, with regards to the ceiling barrier, because surely they're not following the same route we are. They're a much, much larger risk with the service area that they cover. So moving on to joist types, uh, three main joist types that are used, uh, solid timber eye joists, a metal web joist or posi joist, some, as it's sometimes called. Uh, I'll start with solid timber. If you look at it, it's got its advantages, strength, ease of supply, versatile, also easy to provide assessments from different manufacturers. When I say manufacturers, that is a very loose term, a solid timber isn't manufactured, it is just prepared from a tree where the main limitation is the length, um, which is governed by how tall the tree has grown. Uh, this being one of the only few disadvantages uh, with solid timber. I'll skip over our joist for now and speak on metal web or open web as it's called sometimes. The timber used for the top and bottom flanges is kiln dried. So if you look at there, you've got the flange uh, or cord at the top and bottom, either side of the, the metal web. Uh, the reason why it's being kiln dried is to reduce any shrinkage issues in a house, so therefore causing less creaks and groans within the house. This can be manufactured to a length, which is a huge advantage over solid timber. The web used on both sides of the cord to create the tensile, the web is used on either side of the cord to create the tensile strength, which is required. Now talking on the tensile strength, metal web is a very high tensile strength. That is, this coupled with the ability to span longer distances makes this metal open web a far more versatile option in construction as opposed to solid timber. It is important to note though that metal web, is, as in the length that you, that you install into a home, is made to order. And something else that's very important, which is, which is always done in solid timber, is no notches or any drilled holes, aside from the fixing points of fixing a, a plasterboard to the, to the joist, should be made as it will severely impact the structural integrity of the joist, whether that be the, the web or the flange or cord. Onto the eye joist. Uh, so the eye joist uh, is pretty much picking up 50 to 60% of the UK market of new build homes in the UK. It's been around for a long time, around 50 years, I believe. It's very similar in the design to a metal web with a cord and flange or a cord flange at the top and bottom, only with a different web design. And herein lies most of the uncertainty. The wide variety of eye joists on the market means that the assessments become difficult. Let me give you an example uh, of, of, the, of the first eye joist web. Um, the web can range from eight millimeters through to 13 millimeters in width, which is a huge variable across many different manufacturers. Logic would dictate if it was simply this, that if you tested with 8mm web, this will provide a worst case scenario, which I mentioned previously. Unfortunately, it isn't that simple. We look at the material used on the web. This is where it does become a little bit more complex. The majority of the market um, being um, the the vast majority of the market, so the, the brand leader, if you like, of iJoist, use a nine millimeter OSB three board, which is sim 
simply for its structural integrity. The OSB, OS, OSB 3 board shouldn't be confused with ply, which has many layers pressed together with glue, whereas OSB is made of hundreds and thousands of small pieces of hardwood mixed together with a resin to create the web material. The false slash 3 variant just denotes that is used for load bearing applications within humid environments, so very typical of a home. Alternatively, the web can be constructed from plywood or laminated veneer, which again do vary in the width of web. I mentioned this and it does raise most of the assessment questions, as in, will the OSB 3 9mm perform the same as a laminated veneer? And that's something where myself, I am not a structural engineer, I work for a light manufacturer, so that's something I really can't answer. But all I can do is advise where we're at in the industry at the moment. Solid timber and eye joist, albeit different um, in the appearance and aesthetic, actually share the same build specification when we're talking 30, 60, and 90. So if you read through, you'll see that the, the, the specification on joist centers, the specification on wallboard, plasterboard, and 30 minute construction, or type F or fire line plasterboard is used in two layers in the 60 and 90 with the same joist centers throughout. The metal open posi joist, uh, which everyone we call it, uh, we only state the construction for 30 and 60 here as the 90 minutes uh, we would state isn't necessary. The main difference between the 30 and 60 is the flange size along with a slight increase in the size of the web. Other commonalities across all construction types are the types of plasterboard. We use it on the 30 minute test, a 50 mil wallboard across three or three constructions. And then on the 60 and 90 minute durations, we use two 50 mil type F so fire line board. For all these specifications, we've come to the decision on our specifics. Obviously, this is a, quite a general overview of how they are built. Uh, and we've come to this through long discussions, not just internally, but with manufacturers of the various interesting parties. So that's uh, manufacturers of the joist, manufacturers of the plasterboard and so on. And we've made plenty of adjustments along the way uh, due to the, the fact that we're obviously as a, as a business, we've gained more uh, knowledge as we've gone along. So where we use solid timber joists. So solid timber joists, uh, I'm not going to read it verbatim, uh, but traditional in traditional homes, so any home that you'd have seen built from many a year ago will always have used solid timber joists simply because it was readily available, strong, uh, very reliable, very, very few issues with it. It's just in more recent years, it's not become as not been as popular generally through cost at first and then what I've mentioned before with with uh, being able to span further distances. Um, one thing that's quite common across all three construction types as well is the, the floor above you've got to use a minimum of 22 millimeter tongue and groove hardwood or softwood which is uh, I've put at the top of the screen also. So on to the next slide which is eye joist so it's the same render again so you see the eye joist sat in there and again, eye joists are used in new builds, uh, 50 to 60 percent of the market. You're looking along, along those numbers, and they, they actually dominate the house building market. And they continue to go in proper popularity simply because it's strength to weight ratio compared to other options, as it says there. On to metal web. So, metal web joist or posi joist, open web joist uh, is a new joist type in the UK. It's the lightness of timber with a strength of posi struck steel web, allowing you to span far greater distances. So this is creeping up uh, in usage alongside the um, the the eye joist, and I do think this is um, it's going to be around for a long time. So obviously you're saving again on um, on the materials used in the web, and it gives you the full flexibility of uh, moving services across joists without having to notch any holes into a into an eye joist where there are restrictions. So on to the next slide. 
So I want to talk a little bit more now about full scale testing. Full scale testing provides an environment which is as close to a construction environment as is possible. The furnace, which is where the test date is taking place, it has dimensions of three meters by four meters, which is a blank canvas for us as a manufacturer to put a specification forward and then to appoint a joiner to build the ceiling floor to be used in the test, which is all from our spec. It, is, it can't be given by anybody else. Now, this is quite a top level overview to dig deeper about the furnace. Do so believe will increase everybody's awareness. Uh, when talking about the test, regardless of the specified joist, there are three durations of the test, all of which have a predetermined temperature curve, which is stipulated by the BSEN 1363-1 2012. This curve remains the same for any test, any duration. At 30 minutes, 842 degrees, it reaches. 60 minutes, it reaches 945 degrees. And at 90 minutes, it will reach 1006 degrees. I mentioned these specific temperatures as it must be understood just how onerous the testing procedure is. This is the detail graph in the center from uh, one of our tests. Uh, so you can see just how the curve hits that 600 mark within about seven or eight minutes and then it creeps up from there. So it's, it's a really tough situation for the downlights to be in. Um, that's why it's very important to get the, the construction right of the can with the spring and the intumescent material or borosilicate glass as well. And one other thing is well, one talking of the three tests, uh, 30, 60 and 90 minutes, a common misconception is that 90 minute duration tests will also count as a 30 and a 60 minute pass. This is simply not true. The construction of a 30 minute test, as shown on a previous slide, has 600 mil joist centers with a single skin up wall board. A 60 minute test has 600 mil centers, the same as the 30, but has two layers of type F or file iron board. And the 90 minute test has two layers of the type F or file iron board with the 450 mil centers. The picture on the left shows you the inside of the furnace before a test. The bars which are situated under the ceiling are where the thermocouples are situated. There are actually some more within the void and then some above the void. All these parameters that are measured to make sure that they're not, they're not going above allowed values. And then the picture on the right um, shows above the furnace uh, with the ceiling structure completed. Resting on top of the ceiling, you'll see uh, it's the loading on the ceiling, which is another variable, which we're going to explain in the next slide. So on to ceiling loading. We've seen quite a few different interpretations from test reports showing loadings from anywhere between 1 and 1.5 kilonewtons per meter squared. We at Ansel, though, have conducted all of our tests in solid timber, eye joist and 30 minute metal web with 1.5 kilonewtons per meter squared, no less. And this is where the white bolt being written, and not being updated, has caused yet another variable to be considered. More recently, though, uh, take it after taking further advice when we were putting together our spec for the 60 minute metal web duration test. We increased the seal loading for that up to two kilonewtons per meter squared. This simply has just been done to increase the chance when being tested that the ceiling would fail, proving uh, a more onerous environment uh, and therefore giving us more margin for error so that we can as cross assess with other joist manufacturers. This is something we at Ansel will continue to do in the future to ensure that any assessments that we we go for are achievable by making everything that bit more onerous. Talking of what 1.5 kilonewtons per meter squared means, uh, this is the equivalent of a grand piano. Um, the logic, whilst more relevant in the 70s when it was written, uh, does carry through until today. Uh, the white book does state that floors tested with a uniformly distributed load of 1.5 kilonewtons per meter squared which is roughly what a grand piano uh, weighs. This, however, though, or talking about it all, is only relevant when talking of a solid timber construction. 
our decision as a manufacturer is to replicate that loading as a minimum. Um, and why I say that is because the, the white book was written uh, with only solid timber in mind, nothing to do with eye joists and certainly not the metal web. A last note on ceiling loadings. I would, I would expect probably 12 months for decisions to be made as to what we must adhere to for future testing. So whether that be the ceiling loadings, whether that be the uh, most um, onerous tests or what type of plasterboard, I'm pretty sure it's going to stay at 15 mil. Uh, what joist spacings, I'm fairly sure they'll stay the same as what we've done in the past. But there's a lot of little, little bits of nuances like the spacings of screws going through the plasterboard into the, into the timber, the spacings of those, the depth of those screws. So there's, there's quite a few variables that I've not gone into. Uh, I didn't want to go too detailed on specification because it would come away from the, the point that I'm trying to make, um, which is pretty much that. As, as an industry, we, ha, we are still learning about fire testing. And fire testing itself is something which is only going to become more relevant and it's only going to become um, even more stringent. And the NHBC are going to follow up wherever they can and they will prove to you, to us, that it is relevant to get the fire testing done as they will remove any down lights from the from an install with that hasn't got a full scale test report so onto what ansel have achieved so i've tried to keep it um I'm not too heavy on an ansel seminar it's trying to be a little bit more educational um, I spoke at some length now, um, albeit it seems like there's, there's quite a bit more to go through. Uh, and that's certainly something we can, you can talk, talk to us about. We've got our email at the bottom of the page. Um, but basically, this is where we are at at the moment. So with the Orbital 360, the eye cage and the, the, the original prism, they've all got full test reports for all solid timber 30, 60, 90. And we've got 30 and 60 minute durations on them as well. But we have gone that bit further with our edge and our new prism pro and we've also achieved um, 90 minute eye joist along with a 30 minute and 60 minute metal web passes and we do have full scale test certification for all of those which is what we believe to be industry leading um, and what i'd like to leave you with this is um i would always ask to test that, that the check that the downlights you have installed have the correct certification and it is the same as the construction that they've all been installed in. The NHBC are actively, like I mentioned a few times, challenging contractors and then in turn us as manufacturers to prove that we are compliant. And in some cases, requesting all downlights to be changed and then replaced with a compliant downlight, which is far from what we want to answer uh, what we want is everybody to be compliant and we we expect the nhbc and the sta to come back with all the answers that we requested uh, in the very near future so we can get on with this and we can continue to um to grow with our knowledge within the subject matter also so thank you for listening um i do hope you've enjoyed it it's been a fairly uh, brief overview, if I may say, of fire testing and, and the construction. And I'm open to questions.